Women. We start with the last session of the day, Fortifying the Economy, Building Strong Foundation for Sustainable Growth. For this session, we welcome on stage Mr. Kalikesh Singh Deo, Member of Parliament, Lok Sabha, Biju Janata Dal. Mr. Subir Gokarn, Director of Research, Brookings, India. Mr. Surjit S. Bhalla, Chairman, Oxus Investments. For chairing this session, we have with us Mr. Vineet Agrawal, Managing Director, Transport Corporation of India. Vineet started his career in 1996 and is currently the Managing Director of TCI, India's largest logistics company. He graduated from Carnegie Mellon University and the Owner President Management Program from Harvard Business School. He is involved in various social work through his family's foundation and is an avid reader and a marathon runner. We now request Mr. Vineet Agrawal to please conduct the session. Thank you. So, welcome to the last session of the day. Um, I know we are between drinks and uh, this session, so we'll make it quick and interesting. <clears throat> so uh, it's my pleasure to host this session, Fortifying the Economy, Building Strong Foundations for Sustainable Growth. And we have a very good panel here, uh, quite eminent in their own domain and respect. So before we start and ask each of the speakers to present for about 15 minutes and after which we'll open for Q&A, uh, I'll just give out a few pointers in terms of what we are trying to achieve in this session. We want to is heading what will be the impact of certain global uh, macro changes and ultimately what are the policies that are required so that we can actually move from a cycle of, from a boom bust cycle to a more robust, uh, stable environment. Uh, the last few months, economic news has been quite good, except for agriculture. And we know that can affect both products and services demand at the rural level. Uh, nevertheless, I think the consensus is that GDP growth should be around 7 odd percent, which is not bad at all. Uh, a lot has helped the new government also from an economic perspective. Uh, the energy and commodity prices are low. Wholesale and consumer inflation is coming down, and interest rates are also expected to come down. The fiscal deficit is sort of under control. And uh, the currency is stable, and plus, I think the intent of the government is there to make some changes. How, however, there are lots of structural changes that are still needed, and there are structural issues that still stand. Uh, I work in industry, in the logistics industry, and we are sort of the barometer of what is happening in the economy. We operate from 1,400 locations in India, and we get a sense of what is getting picked up from every part of the country. Uh, we know that India still languishes at the bottom of the table that is at number 134 in the ease of doing business globally. Uh, to highlight that fact, let me give an example that I off quote, uh, which we face daily in our business of logistics. The average speed of a truck in India is 23 kilometers per hour. And uh, this is a study that was done by IIM Calcutta and our organization in 2011. And this is mainly because of uh, state border check posts, toll booths, and of course, corruption. Uh, we waste a lot of fuel and time equal to roughly about 80,000 odd crores waiting at the toll booths. So clearly, infrastructure, or rather the lack of infrastructure, is a major structural issue that needs to be addressed. The index of industrial production has also showed continuous weakness, and the overall output has been low. As I said, we do observe this from almost all parts of the industry, be it the engineering sector, be it the capital goods sector. Credit is also extremely tight. The banks are not funding, and uh, we see our receivables are still very slow. So there was some inventory buildup that has happened in the last few months, and that has again been exhausted. So, and that is clearly evident from the gro gross uh, fixed capital formation rate is yet to recover. It's under the 30% uh, rate. The government clearly has a very strong mandate from the people. Uh, and this is the strongest it has been in the last 30 years. And I think, and I think most people would agree that this is the time that we 
need to not only jumpstart the economy, but also create a base of policies that do not swing with political power. So um, I would like to invite the first speaker today is uh, Dr. Subir Gokran. He is the director of research at the Brookings Institution, India Center. He is the former deputy governor of the Reserve Bank of India, where he oversaw the monetary policy, financial markets, and research, amongst other things. Uh, a celebrated economist, he has been the chief economist of Standard & Poor for Asia Pacific, the executive director and chief economist of Crystal, and the chief e econo economist of the NCAER. Dr. Gokhran. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Agarwal, and thank you uh, to the organizers for inviting me to share my thoughts at this event. Uh, there were three questions, or three broad sets of issues that uh, were posed. First, uh, sort of uh, the macro situation, where it stands, and uh, what it means for, uh, for growth, uh, and particularly for sustainable growth. The second is uh, actions that the government can take to realize the potential that this relatively benign macro environment provides. And third, uh, very importantly, uh, how do you break out of this uh, stop-start, uh, what I've been calling the roller coaster pattern, where you know, a few years of good growth are typically followed by uh, you know, a slump, uh, whether there is some way around this. And I think, to some extent, the answers to, to the second and third uh, questions are interrelated. Uh, let me start by talking about the macro situation. The highlights that uh, Mr. Agarwal uh, laid out, I think, are, are all very well known. We've had uh, a very significant change in the, a positive change in the macro environment over the last uh, eight or nine months, uh, partly due to actions that uh, the government took, starting perhaps going back to uh, late 2013, uh, and following through uh, after the change in regime, uh, but also very significantly because the uh, oil prices dropped so sharply. Uh, we've stopped looking at oil prices. If you look at them over the last uh, couple of weeks, they are starting to show signs of going back up again, so I think we have to be a little watchful about this pattern. But certainly if compared to $100 plus dollars a barrel, uh, you know, even 60 or 65 is, is very, very comforting. Uh, and they had dropped, of course, as low as uh, 55 or 50. Uh, but uh, the number is not the issue. The issue is what does it do to uh, the domestic macro situation? Uh, oil impacts us in three very significant ways, uh, all of which were pointed out. Well, two were pointed out. The third is the current account uh, or the balance of payments. Uh, we've seen inflation come down very sharply. Uh, from uh, about 75 to 8% on the consumer price index a year ago to about 5% now. In fact, the wholesale price index or, is in a state of negative inflation. It's not deflation, it's negative inflation. Uh, and that's a great relief because that does open up the opportunity for monetary policy to, to uh, start providing some stimulus, which it has done with two uh, interest rate reductions and obviously there are expectations that more will follow. Uh, there is a great fiscal benefit from the uh, impact of lower oil prices on the subsidy bill. Uh, we have a number of products that are subsidized that are directly related to, to fuel prices, to oil prices, uh, certainly kerosene and LPG are two significant ones, uh, but fertilizers are also directly correlated fertilizer price costs are directly correlated with oil prices. So the subsidy bill narrows automatically there as well. Uh, these uh, benefits will play out over the course of the year. And uh, so without doing very much, uh, clearly we do get a fiscal dividend from lower oil prices. Uh, most importantly, from the viewpoint of vulnerability, external vulnerability, uh, oil prices help to narrow the current account deficit even further. And this takes me back to actions taken in late 2013 to, to achieve exactly this, which is uh, the constraints, the restrictions on gold imports, which helped at that point to, to narrow the current account deficit. We're starting to see gold imports going back up again, but uh, lower oil prices are sort of absorbing that shock. And so we're going to see the current account 
remaining fairly, uh, you know, moderate, the deficit remaining fairly moderate over the foreseeable future, next uh, few months, maybe next year or so. Uh, and uh, that in turn contributes to a relatively stable rupee. So uh, what were points of great vulnerability a few months ago are now points of some comfort, some stability, and that's really the platform when we look at our previous episode of high growth, 2003 to 2008, uh, we have to remember that the platform for this was virtually the same kind of macroeconomic conditions, with low inflation, a fiscal deficit that was being brought under control through the FRBM, the Fiscal Responsibility and Budget Management Act, and a very, very narrow current account deficit, which in fact for three of those five years was in surplus. Uh, so, to me, these are uh, the preconditions for uh, a possible growth spurt, but they're only preconditions, they're not, they're not causes. Uh, so, how do we translate the potential, the opportunity into a faster growth? Uh, we have to deal with three very fundamental issues now, I think, and uh, this also then relates to why we do this stop-start pattern in growth. The most important right now is infrastructure. Uh, we've really struggled to find the right model for bringing private investment into infrastructure. Uh, we first thought it could be only private in the mid-90s. Uh, other than telecom in the early 2000s, that proved to be a complete bust. Then we thought public-private partnership, which uh, we tried from the mid-2000s. Yes, some successes, but overall as a national strategy, this turned out to be much uh, below expectations. And not only has it not given us the necessary increase in infrastructure capacity, it's also put a very, very large burden on, on bank balance sheets. So the ability of banks to lend to anybody else is constrained by the bad assets that they're carrying from the infrastructure sector. So it's a double whammy. There's not enough infrastructure and there's a lot of bad assets. So what is the solution? Now the solution, I think this government has recognized and uh, certainly a view that I've been propagating uh, is that we need to go back to public. So the partnership, the only private is not working, the public private is not working, so there's only one option there, which is to go back to public. Uh, that has been recognized and, and acted upon in the budget uh, by way of the National Infrastructure and Investment Fund, by way of higher provisions for capital expenditure, uh, but it's not yet been oper operationalized, and I think we need to see very quick action on that. What does only public mean? I don't think it means that we stay with the public sector for eternity. Uh, I would like to call it uh, moving from the PPP framework to what I'd call an FPTP, which is uh, uh, first public and then private. We have, to, we have to take projects to a level where private investors of different uh, risk appetites can come into ownership. And I think that requires a significant public role to begin with, to take the projects uh, up to the point where their ca cash flows are are becoming visible, maybe a two year or three year uh, horizon. At that point, investors, uh, a wide range of investors with different risk appetites would actually find these assets relatively appealing. Uh, I think one of the big learnings from our PPP experience is the private sector uh, did not have the capacity to take on the early stage risk of these projects for a variety of reasons. And uh, we have to accept that, we have to look at the private sector entering only at later points in the project cycle. So that's the first challenge. The second is with food. Uh, we have been able to deal with food inflation, I think, quite successfully in the last uh, year. And uh, the main reason for this, the main, uh, the two factors. One is that uh, procurement prices were capped. Uh, the increase in procurement prices in the last one year was substantially lower than it has been in the previous four. And two, open market sales of stocks were, uh, were, uh, were done. So both rice and wheat were sold uh, from, the, from the food corporation stocks into the market. And that has helped bring food inflation down considerably, not the only factor, but it has contributed. Rice prices were increasing by about 17% a year between 2012 and 2014. As soon as the stock sales started, that rate of increase actually went down to about five, between five and six percent. And in the last uh, data release for March, uh, the increase in cereal prices about 2.3 percent. 
notwithstanding all of what's been happening on rainfall and, and damaged crops and everything else, the rate of increase in cereal prices has been contained. So this would endorse the view that, you know, use buffer stocks to manage food inflation one way or the other. Now, of course, there are certainly welfare and human implications, uh, quality of life implications uh, that emerge from damaged crops and, and losses, and, and we should all be very sensitive to this. But uh, the solution to this is not necessarily, in fact, not at all, to offer higher prices for a crop that ends up only being put into buffer stocks. And we have to look at safety nets for the rural sector in a very different and, uh, and a much more efficient way. So that's, that's one sort of series of reforms I think we have to be focused on. And now is the time, I think, to start thinking more seriously about how to put meaningful safety nets in place. Uh, we already have one in the form of the NREGA, but you know, we have to look at ways to make it more comprehensive and, of course, at the same time, more efficient. Uh, the second, uh, or the third uh, feature of the, or the third uh, challenge is jobs. Uh, we have, uh, as everybody knows, a demographic dividend that could very easily turn into a demographic uh, nightmare, uh, a disaster. And uh, the focus on uh, make in India and skilling and so on are all very important pieces of that puzzle. But we need to, it's not a complete picture yet. Uh, we need to act on labor. We need to act, infrastructure is very critical here. We need to act on the GST to make a genuine national market. Uh, this is interesting contrast between Europe and India here. And India is an, a nation state, a single nation with 29 or 30 or 35 markets, depending on how you count. And the EU is a single market with 27 nations. It's the exact opposite. And I think the impact of the unification and harmonization of the tax regime in the EU had a very, very powerful impact on that uh, economy's performance, notwithstanding more recent record. Uh, I think there's something to learn from the EU in terms of the benefits of a single integrated market. And uh, in, in which case, uh, Mr. Agarwal's uh, was about trucks stopping you know, at borders for, for days on end uh, should hopefully go away. I don't know if we'll find a way to beat that, but that should be one of the benefits of, uh, of the, of the uh, GST. Uh, so let me conclude then by talking about the roller coaster phenomenon. Why do we grow in spurts and then collapse? I think the simple one factor explanation for that uh, is we simply don't uh, build capacity ahead of requirement. Uh, we're always running into one or the other capacity constraints. And obviously, if, if you run into a binding constraint in any system, in any process, uh, that becomes the defining, that becomes the uh, capacity. So in this up and down, 2003 to 2015, these, to me, are the three constraints that we hit against. Uh, we stopped, we slowed down because we ran into a food constraint, explaining food inflation uh, and the consequences it had for various other things, including high interest rates. Uh, we ran into a massive uh, infrastructure constraint because we, in the five years that we were trying to use the PPP framework, we really didn't get very far in terms of a system. Yes isolated pockets of success, but it didn't add up to a national infrastructure uh, uh, outcome. Uh, and jobs, we, we simply just haven't created jobs at the pace that we need to. So how do we get out of this? I think how we get out of this is to be anticipating these bottlenecks, these constraints, and doing things to, to, uh, to create the capacity to deal with them. Uh, final word, telecom. Um, not getting to the net neutrality debate, that, that is an important issue, but not directly related to what I'm saying. Uh, between 2003 and 2008, telecom was one of the most powerful productivity enhancing uh, changes in the economy. Everybody was uh, very quickly uh, sort of uh, enabled and empowered by the speed at which telecom services rolled out. Uh, you no longer had to be in office, you no longer had to be in, in a given place, you no longer were worried about traffic snarls because you could be talking or, or emailing from your, from your vehicle. Now we're back to almost uh, the pre-boom days because uh, telecom capacity has become extremely constrained. 
And all the benefits we saw of, of uh, that massive surge in capacity are now being diluted because the arteries are choked. And to me, that is perhaps the best example of, of not looking far enough ahead, not anticipating uh, the kind of capacity requirements that we would have from a system uh, that would keep us going for 20 or 25 or 30 years and not just three, four or five years. So the way to avoid the roller coaster is, I think, in one word, anticipate. Thank you. Uh, before I move on to the next speaker, can I quickly ask everyone for a quick uh, photo opportunity for the media? Because they need to have a deadline. So, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Gokran. Uh, now I'm pleased to invite a promising young politician with a great political pedigree, Mr. Kalikesh Singh Deo, to share his outlook on fortifying the economy. Uh, Mr. Singh Deo is a scion of the royal family of uh, Bolangir, Bolangir in Odisha and is the second time MP from there. A progressive parliamentarian, he founded a fellowship program to give young people a chance to work with MPs. He's also a member of the Standing Committee on Petroleum and Natural Gas. Over to you, Dr. Mr. Singh. Um, thank you, Vineet. I am not as much an economist as Subir or Surjit are. I'm a politician. I barely made it through my economics uh, degree in college here in Stephens, but did have some element of uh, private sector experience. Um, I was incidentally one of the uh, negotiators for the Dabol project with the government before I joined politics. So it, I think it was one of the largest failures we've had in India in terms of private infrastructure coming into the energy market. I'm going to try and give you a political perspective of what I see, which goes on, which I've seen in the last seven, eight years as an MLA and MP. Um, not Good economics doesn't always make good politics. We see that consistently in, uh, I'm sure, decisions that you find irrational from successive governments. But today we have two major issues pending in parliament. We've got that of the land acquisition bill. We've got that of GST. I think any and every business would agree that both these bills are critical to ensure that you get some investment into the economy. So we have spoken about the good impact the GST will have. I think what he didn't explicitly state, but I can tell you now is, one of the initial major hiccups of the private players coming into the economy in, under the PPP mode has been of land acquisition, has been of pre-development and development phases. That's why they're scared to come into projects which uh, tend to get stalled and take years and years to complete. So as a good economist, I would say these are critical. However, you find even now, with the kind of majority that the BJP enjoys in parliament, there's still hesitation from the government's perspective to try and push these two uh, critical uh, initiatives through. As far as land acquisition is concerned, the hesitation, of course, comes not only from the fact that there's very strong opposition that has given it a twist of an anti-farmer bill, which has been successful across northern India, it also comes from a lot of resistance from within the BJP political setup. If you were to talk, take a vote of, in secret of MPs in the BJP party right now, I can assure you 75% of them would say, let's not get this bill in. And that's reality. The fact is that they believe, that the party believes they're toying with a concept which will completely destroy them in the years to come and will certainly have an impact in Bihar and in Uttar Pradesh. That's perception. True or not is something which is going to be followed later. As far as GST is concerned, by and large, all most states have got on board, especially after the government of India has assured all state governments that if 
in the first three years there will be any losses to the states, the government of India will make do. So I think you'll have a much easier ride with that. But my point being, not always rational steps are taken by governments. The first, and maybe rightly so, priority of any government or any political establishment is to see how they come, in, come in back into power the next time round. And that comes even now in India, mostly from rural, rural India, mostly from the agrarian sector. However, again irrationally, most successive governments have talked about improving the lot of the rural, of rural India and trying to ensure that agriculture becomes more lucrative. It's just remained at talks. Nobody has really got into fixing the structural uh, reforms which are required in the in agriculture sector to try and ensure that something is actually done about it. We are, we have a better macroeconomic scenario right now. Fiscal deficits coming down. Um, the government of India has managed to push, or at least push a per perception down corporate India about the possibility of improving economic uh, factors coming in the future. I don't, I don't think there's been much change on ground as yet. The perception has increased, yes. If you talk to businessmen, they get very happy about the whole Modi government's push towards improving efficiency, improving transparency, ensuring there's an ease of business. But nothing, not much has changed on ground. The first thing that the government is beginning to realize now is that talking about concepts and talking about ideas is one thing. Implementing it down through the vast bureaucratic setup that we have is another altogether. The prime minister sitting in his office can come up with ideas, can come up with policies, the parli parliament can legislate, but until your local tahsildar down at the district level or your local block development officer or your local thanedar follows that policy to the law, you will not have the desired change that you seek. We've had some luck with the oil prices coming down. That's led to some control on the fiscal deficit. That's not going to last. It's a two-year, one-year, two-year, three-year thing at the most. The United States or the UAE, at one, or the, the difficulties between the United States and the UAE at, the, at, the, at this point of time, will, they'll come to an agreement. The whole Russia and Venezuela specter will go away. They will decide how much marginal oil production to carry on with in the future, and you'll have oil prices arriving at you know, uh, succeedingly uh, progressing from here upwards. So this cushion we have is for a year or two. It's not going to last long. The one of the sectors that the government talks a lot of is agriculture. And subsidies is what Subban, uh, Mr. Gokhan was talking about. Subsidies in the agriculture sector is completely misdirected. I don't know if any of you here are from the fertilizer sector at all, but there's almost a 70% uh, subsidy to, the, to urea at this point of time. Urea is supposed to be used at a ratio of 4 is to 2 is to 1, along with other kinds of fertilizers, to achieve maximum production. But because there's a 11,000 rupee uh, subsidy on urea and the farmer...